Okay, well, we'll uh, get started here. Thanks everyone for uh, uh, visiting with us today. Um, when I first came here in, in 2016, the, the, it was clear that the, the uh, vineyard needed a lot of work. And, and so that took me in two directions. Uh, one, uh, biodynamics, which I felt was the, the proper way to bring health back to the vineyard, but also to uh, uh, start with professional viticulture. Uh, I think the, the, the viticulture that we've been practicing here at, at that point was uh, not adequate, perhaps not as enlightened as it could have been. And it, and it, and it really showed in the wine. So it was this combination of doing professional viticulture and then layering biodynamics on top of that, which is a very complex thing. Um, of course, the vineyard we had, had had lots of issues, which we'll get into in a minute, but we wanted to address everything. And, and in the process, we actually made the decision to replant the entire vineyard. So it became even more essential to have a professional viticulturist uh, working with us. So, um, we contacted Jason. Jason is a, a graduate of uh, University of California at Davis in viticulture, and then also from uh, a master's from Montpellier in Southern France, France, Languedoc, which is obviously perfect for us and the type of varieties that we're growing. And um, so he, he, he really had to take over an entire program that not only included uh, uh, a total replanting and restructuring of a vineyard, but um, shifting to biodynamics. So working with, you know, obviously conventional, we work with um, organic and now by biodynamic. And uh, also before that, he was the uh, manager of the famous stagecoach vineyard in the Napa Valley. So we feel it's a real asset to happen here in Southern Oregon. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and let him go into his background and then talk about our project a little sure. bit. Um, so yeah, Craig kind of gave you a little bit of the, the big picture. Um, I actually originally grew up in Hawaii and ended up going to UC Davis, which brought me to viticulture in the first place. And uh, from Davis, I, as Craig mentioned, went to uh, uh, worked at Stagecoach Vineyard for quite a few years, about four years, and then had an opportunity to go to Europe and, and do a master's that was based in Montpellier. But I um, did my master's, uh, my second year master's actually through Portugal um, in uh, Lisbon. And uh, that is, that, that uh, master's actually what brought me to Southern Oregon. I was looking for a uh, master's thesis to do that was both interesting and close to Portland where my, at the time, my uh, fiance, now wife, uh, was studying her own master's degree. And there was a project here in Southern Oregon that uh, was interesting and fit. And so I came here thinking I would do a quick master's and uh, then maybe go back to Napa or do something else and uh, have never left since. So I think I'm going on six, seven years now. Um, and uh, yeah, been really fun to work on this Troon project. You know, I had a lot of experience with um, organic management, uh, vineyard management before, but not so much um, experience with uh, biodynamics and had a lot of interest in it, but hadn't actually had a chance to practice that. So this has been new for me on that front, but um you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, others, you know, things about Troon I was familiar with. It's uh, been a work in progress on on lots of levels. There was a, a old, really historic for this region um, vineyard planted on the property, but has been managed and expanded over many years uh, with, you know, various different crews and different ownership. And so had lots of different problems that had resulted from those many years of of you know different different uh, philosophies being practiced, and uh, yeah, so now we're working on revamping both the practices and the vineyards. So as we replant older vineyards that are problematic, and try to rejuvenate the uh, older blocks that we uh, think have have value. Um, Jason, uh, uh, what got you know? You've seen a huge transition here from when you you first came. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we should start talking about the soil itself, which has been a, a major transition and what has been done to change. I, when I came here, it was like concrete, you know, it was like yeah. out there and everything. And now, and now it's, it, it's uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, it's a totally different condition. So perhaps you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, any, any good vineyard management 
practice, I mean, really, it, whether it's organic or biodynamic or conventional needs to be focused on the soil and managing soil. And that goes a lot towards managing cover crop and, and you know, what's growing in the soil. You know, when we first started, you know, me and Craig on, on this property, um, yeah, the soil was in really poor shape. And, and since starting, we um, have done a lot of work trying to improve our cover cropping systems. I mean, that was step number one. Um, you know, trying to get, we, we've started the first few years growing out green manures. So these are mixes of cover crops that will um, grow out to try to produce a lot of biomass and then chop it and till it into the soil to try to add um, organic matter. Um, and that combined with adding compost um, has had a huge impact on just soil structure. Um, along with that, we've been doing other um, additions to the soil, uh, fertigation, et cetera. We've really been throwing everything at these older vineyards. And it's pretty amazing to see the transformation in, I mean, just in vine health, I think any layperson could have walked through the vineyards three years ago and then walked through them, you know, now and be able to see the difference in, in, in the vine health, you know, in terms of color and vigor and, and really in fruit quality as well. Um, you know, we're, we're now, now that we've, we've, we've gotten, through this process of just trying to rebuild organic matter, um, we're going to start moving towards um, uh, no-till systems, and that's going to be gradual. Um, and, and everything that we do is very block by block. Very, you know, we have a lot of different soil types on the property and a lot of different rootstock scion, uh, a variety combination. So each each uh, decision is made block by block. But the long-term um, strategy is to move towards a completely no-till. So we'll start um, by moving the vineyard avenues into some no-till cover cropping. Um, so that just means trying to do more mowing and eventually maybe even doing um, roller crimper um, style uh, management as opposed to mowing, um, which just actually knocks, it knocks the stalks down and, and crimps them or breaks them without um, actually chopping them up. And that creates a nice mulch layer. Um, so long term, that we're we're starting to move towards that, and eventually, what we'd like to do is um, even move the areas underneath the vines, which currently we're managing with um, a combination of different tillage practices. Um, but eventually, we'd like to to move even that to no till and just be mowing underneath the vines. Obviously, um, that's something that you want to do with vines that are well established. So the younger vineyards are going to have to be transitioned into that but we'll start experimenting with some of the older vineyards um, very soon, I think, maybe in the next year or two, um, trying to establish those areas as, as no-till. There's a lot of advantages to no-till. Again, I think it, it was good that we did a lot of tillage early to try to improve the soil and incorporate a lot of organic matter, but long-term, um, tillage is not great for, for soil. You're, you're breaking up a lot of the, the healthy microorganisms, especially earthworm activity, but a lot of other um, beneficial organisms just don't really like being you know, mixed around, as you can imagine. I don't think any of us would like it either. Um, and um, creating a, a healthy no-till system improves water infiltration into the soil. It improves um, or reduces in, uh, compaction from, from tractor traffic or other vehicle traffic um, and just allows a combination of earthworms and microorganisms to create their own pores and their own systems underground with, without having to, uh, you know, be be disturbed by regular tillage and um, grapevine roots, but all plant roots really appreciate that. They, they thrive with, uh, you know, having a healthy microorganism base down there that, that works with the vine roots to extract um, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, long-term that's our, that's our strategy in terms of our vineyard management, um, floor management, um, I would say. Uh, yeah, any other questions on that point? Do you do dry farming only? Not at the moment, although, you know, our our goal is to try to start working towards dry farming for some of the new blocks. Uh, again, this is a very sort of block by block question. Keep in mind, we're working over, you know, 40 acres over, I don't actually know, Craig, it's maybe 20 different blocks that, you know, if you want to break it up by variety. And so some of the blocks we've come very close, some of the older blocks, we've already come very close to dry farming this last couple of years. So maybe one or two irrigations towards the end of the season. Um, but in my opinion, you really need to work a vine, sort of train a vine towards dry farming. It's very hard to wean a vine off of drip irrigation when it's been irrigated, especially through drip for many, many years. 
And so we're, we're working towards that in some of these older blocks, but slowly and gradually. And the newer vines, we're going to start trying to establish them with maybe not dry farming, but we'll call it off dry farming um, as well, you know, trying to minimize our irrigation, if not completely eliminate it. Even if we have blocks that we might not irrigate during the dry season when they need water, we'll still utilize some of the irrigation systems just to apply some of these compost teas and um, some of the other um, you know, organic products that we might want to add to the soil just to stimulate microbial activity. Um, so yeah, the, those systems are not wasted even if our, our goal is to not um, add a lot of extra water during the, during the growing season. Yeah, it's very, it's very hard too when you have, have had vines that some of them have been uh, uh, irrigated quite heavily for an extended period of time before we took them over. Uh, as you mentioned, it's just not something you just can't turn off the spigot on them. They're not trained to do it. Right. You can, but you won't like the results. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Neither will the vines. Yeah. Uh, what have you found some of the biggest uh, uh, challenges to transition from a conventional uh, vineyard, farm vineyard to biodynamics and organics? Hmm. The challenges. I mean, I think really one of the biggest challenges um, for organic and biodynamic um, uh, viticulture when compared to, to conventional is just floor management, you know, is, is weed management, let's call it. Although I think we've had a lot of discussions about how maybe uh, the word weed has sometimes a, 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 is sometimes a misnomer. Um, obviously, it's very easy to, um, to spray the area under the vines with herbicide and walk away. I mean, that's the simplest, cheapest, and easiest way to manage. But the problem with that is that it, it really um, is not good for soil structure, regardless of the poisons that you're adding to the, the, the soil. Having nothing growing on, an, on, on any piece of ground is kind of the worst case scenario, in my opinion, for farming anything, whether it's vineyards or in, and growing any other plant. You really want to have your soil have some life to it. So transitioning that area that's been strip sprayed for years underneath the vine to um, you know, try to improve the soil. Um, and again, we've been doing you know, under the vine tillage to try to uh, control weeds in that area for now. And under the vine tillage is just, it's, it's very intensive. You know, we have to do a lot of passes every year. And um, you know, there's a lot of fairly expensive equipment um, and there's a lot of learning curve when it comes to operators. You know, it's, a, it's a very high skilled um, operation to run a piece of machinery that's going underneath the vines and has to be tripped by a sensor and go around each vine without damaging those vines. And so trying to get um, the Troon team kind of up to speed on that, um, on that equipment, but at the same time, trying to actually do a good job managing the soil underneath those vines in those areas, which has sort of had, had the worst condition from the beginning was definitely one of, the, one of the key challenges. And I think that's one of the challenges for even a, if, even a vineyard that is established as organic, managing weeds organically um, is, is always a challenge and can be expensive, which again is why we've chosen to eventually really try to move towards not rather than tilling and keeping that under the vine area bare, trying to eventually move towards a no-till system where we have, you know, active roots underneath that, that soil of cover crop that are, that are being beneficial, we'll probably use um, uh, nitrogen fixing primarily plants to try to actually be able to be improving that soil by having something growing there instead of having to continue to to till it over and over and, you know, have, you know, many, many extra passes through the vineyard, which adds compaction, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a, a work in progress, but if I had to choose one thing that's the biggest challenge, it's probably been, been weed and floor management. Um, you know, everything else about the transition, I think has gone very smoothly and it doesn't always, but I think we have a really good team that's really dedicated to doing this and um, everyone's really pitched in to, to make it, um, make it pretty smooth. What about some of the, the new products that are used for weed control? Sure. So along with um, under the vine tillage, we do been doing a lot of experimenting with um, organic herbicides. Um, there's been a lot of organic herbicides on the market and played with for years. I mean, for decades, really. And none of them have really been worth, worth the effort. Um, they either haven't worked well or they've been far too expensive to uh, be worth um, applying. It's really just in the last few years that people, and I mean, this, this is a part of a movement really to try to create better uh, biological 
um, products for, for agriculture, whether it be herbicides or fungicides, et cetera. And um, there's just a few that have come about that have, that have finally become worth using. And we've experimented with a few of these. The one that we've landed on actually using on a regular basis is called Weed Slayer, which is a, um, it's a clove oil-based um, product. I think it's eugenol is the active ingredient, which has been around for a very long time. And um, they've, they've, they've known about clove oil and its properties. The problem has been that you had to use it in such high concentrations that it was far too expensive to be worth um, the effort. And um, recently, uh, 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 a new company has created a version of this product that is combined with a biosurfactant. So basically, a, a product that comes from just a biological fermentation, when combined together, it allows you to use much lower concentrations of the um, clove oil, but still have a really um, you know, significant effect on weeds. And we'll never rely on that as our primary weed control. But um, again, especially in an environment like, like Oregon, where you have you know, soggy soils some parts of the year, it's a really useful tool to be able to um, you know, control weeds selectively during the times here, you might not be able to get a tractor in. Um, the other real big benefit is that um, you can run a very lightweight um, ATV through to apply this as opposed to a heavy tractor. And so it really minimizes compaction. Um, but again, you know, our, our long-term goal is not actually to try to keep those strips under the vine bare. Long-term, we hope to be using, you know, cover crops into that area. So even that is still kind of just part of the temporary plan, the transition plan, if you will. Uh, to get into a full full no-till system. Um, you can also see that we, um, inside the rows here, you can see that, that some of this cover crop is is lower and, and yellower, and that's where we sprayed an organic um, herbicide that, that helps to slow down the growth. It won't completely kill the plants, but it'll slow them down just enough so that they don't inhibit um, any of the, uh, the the plant growth. And we, we may come through and um, clean those out with a uh, Clemens uh, weed knife. Um, but we may actually let those grow and, and provide some extra biodiversity for the vineyard since we're planning to till and um, incorporate all of the cover crop that's between the rows. Um, powdery mildew is, is uh, you know, the great curse of uh, grape growers. Yes. And, and uh, sulfur has been the tr traditional remedy. Uh, but the, the, the pattern you've introduced uh, greatly reduces the, the um, sulfur applications by using other products. Yeah, talk about those products and and uh, the type of impact they have. Yeah, so um, it's kind of along similar lines of what I was mentioning with that um, organic herbicide product. Is there's you know it used to really be that sulfur and maybe um, uh, oil were really the two go to products for um, powdery mildew control and really for fungicides in general um, in organic viticulture. And of course, we still use sulfur. Sulfur still has an important place in our program. But um, we've, you know, there's a lot of issues with sulfur. One, it is fairly toxic product um, and it's very effective, but, um, you know, we don't want to sp spray that all season long if we can help it. So we've started to experiment and, and use more other products. And there's a number of other products that um, are fairly new and are, are very effective. Um, you know, oil is one that's actually been around for a long time. So we, we in, in any organic system or organic fungicide um, spray program, I'd usually try to incorporate both oil and sulfur regardless. Sulfur is very effective, but it does have a really um, damaging effect on, on certain uh, beneficials, especially beneficial mite populations. And so again, we try to minimize that. Oil um, also can be used as a very mild insecticide and so is able to control some insects, um, especially uh, uh, nymphs, insect nymphs that, that we don't want. So incorporating that as sort of a dual purpose, but then moving into products like, um, like regalia, which is actually a plant extract. Uh, the way that works is fascinating. It's, it actually doesn't act directly on the fungus. What it does is it stimulates the plant's um, immune responses to make cell walls stronger and to just generally uh, stimulate plant growth um, so that the plant can resist fungal infections on its own. And um, I, I've really enjoyed working with that product. It's especially useful uh, to combine with any foliar applications we need to to correct nutrition imbalances. Because you can imagine if you're stimulating the plant's growth, it also is going to do a good job at utilizing those, those um, nutrients that we're adding at the same time. Um, 
what are some of these other products? Um, uh, uh, there's a whole range of products that um, that are based uh, in uh, with Bacillus thuringiensis, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a tongue twister. Uh, and um, all of them are slightly different, but essentially what those are doing is creating a, a competitor for those fungus. So we're spraying them, them out into the, the field in order to one, create a biofilm on the plants that is gonna take the space that otherwise would be taken by powdery mildew. So, you know, they're just, they're competing with the powdery mildew for um, nutrition and, and space, but also have a, um, you know, a, 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 they, they actually do also kill the powdery mildew with some, some of the, you know, the chemicals they produce themselves. And so um, that's also been an important part of that, that non-sulfur um, spray program. Um, there's one more product that we actually haven't used, but we're gonna start using this year. And I'm kind of excited to, to it's finally on the market um, because I've known about it for a long time. It was actually uh, created uh, in Lisbon where I studied years ago and was in, in development when I was there. And I saw some experiments being used with it. It works really well. Um, it's called ProBlad and it is a, uh, an extract of lupin, um, and it also is uh, it is a, it's a it's a contact product, so it it actually kills the fungus as you know whatever it, whatever any fungus that it touches it kills. But it's a again a, a plant based um, uh, extract that um, seems to work really well, and again is very it's very non toxic, it's very safe, and overall whenever we have an option to use something that's as least toxic as possible to both animals, humans, and beneficial organisms of any kind, whether it's fungus or insects, we're going to try to go that route. And so, you know, our primary focus is to keep the vines healthy, but secondary focus is to keep all the other organisms in the vineyard healthy so that they can help us to, to keep a good balance uh, overall. So that's a dramatic reduction in sulfur that's yes. applied to the vineyard. A third? Probably more than that. I would say. Two thirds, maybe. Yeah, maybe two thirds. I mean, you know, the other downside of sulfur, and this has kind of been you know, this has obviously been known for a long time is that sulfur is something that if you spray when it's very hot out can actually have a toxic effect on plants. And so by moving away from sulfur and some of these other products that do not have um, uh, that, that issue, they can be sprayed when it's warm out. It helps us too to be able to work around biodynamic applications and not interfere with those, but also to spray at the most optimal timing so that we don't have to, um, you know, uh, be concerned about actually hurting our plants by, by spraying sulfur or oil. Okay, um, for us, uh, you know, the, the, the main problem we've had here with our existing vineyards uh, uh, has been red blotch virus. Uh, perhaps we could talk about red blotch a little bit as it's sure. up in the news a lot. Yeah, it has been. Um, you know, there's been a number of grapevine viruses around for a long time, but this is kind of the newest one that's come on the scene. At least from a scientific point of view, they, they've, they've established that this virus has been around on the West Coast for decades. They um, extracted some, some of the virus from some, I think it was in the 1970s, some leaves that have been collected at Davis. So they know that it's been around, but they've just recently discovered it as an alternative to leaf roll, which is the, the virus that looks very similar, but is actually a very, very different from a, um, for, uh, from a uh, it's, it's a DNA virus versus a RNA virus. So it's very different from a, um, a virologist point of view. Um, so this virus is um, starting to become a problem all across the West Coast. Its primary impact on the vine is reducing color and sugar. Um, and, you know, although it's hard to measure these things, probably flavor to some degree or another. And um, because it's so new, they, they really don't have a full picture of um, what is spreading this virus, but it's almost certainly some kind of insect just based on other viruses that are similar to it. But it is most certainly being spread somehow from vineyard to vineyard. And so trying to manage it is not only a problem for the vineyard that is, has been infected or the vines that have been infected, but also the vines around it. And so you can imagine that since we have some amount of red blotch infected, infected vines on the property, while we replant vineyards, we have to think about both taking care of the older blocks that, that ha have been infected by this virus. And in that case, what we're trying to do is a lot of the things we've been talking about, which is just try to improve overall plant health and reduce plant stress. 
um, and, and pretty much all of these practices we're doing are, are geared towards that goal. Um, now, the, the other uh, strategy that we have to figure out is how to not have these, these brand new blocks that are being planted um, with exceptionally clean material. We're going very far out of our way to try to make sure we're planting new vines that are not infected with red blotch or any other disease that we, we might be worried about. Um, and so um, there's a number of strategies we've had to do this. Um, one is that the, 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 the most likely, but there's one vector that they've identified, but this probably isn't the entire story. And, and the vector they've identified is called the three cornered alfalfa tree hopper. Um, and this is a kind of, you know, maybe a one centimeter long um, little creature. Kind of maybe looks a little bit like a, like a leaf, a, a grasshopper, but, but more compact. And um, it, we theorized that it's probably being vectored by this insect, but also other relatives of that insect, although scientists haven't yet confirmed that. And so based on that assumption, we've been trying to be mindful of the habitat of this insect, since we're not going to go out and spray um, uh, insecticide to try to kill it, which even in conventional situations, I usually wouldn't recommend. What we are doing is trying to manage the, the areas around the vineyard and inside the vineyard so it's less um, uh, hospitable or less attractive to, to that particular insect. Now that has to be balanced with all of the, um, you know, other goals that we have for our cover cropping system. So one of the, the, the downsides of the situation is that we, um, we, we think that this insect is attracted to a spot, a lot of legumes. So nitrogen fixing plants, and we want to incorporate nitrogen fixing plants into the, the cover cropping system for obvious reasons. We want to increase organic matter and, and nitrogen in the soil. Um, so we've had to make some tough decisions and, and that has gone into that um, strategy that I described earlier, which is a lot of um, annual cover crops that we're then tilling under to create um, green manure and improve organic matter. But also what that does is it eliminates um, some of those potentially problematic species during later in the growing season, during the active growing season um, of the vines, which hopefully is limiting the encroachment of that um, species into the vineyard. Now, keep in mind, once if you don't have the virus in your vineyard, um, or at least not a lot of it, you don't have to worry about this insect. The, the insect is not in and of itself a problem. It's only as a vector of the virus. So again, each block is being treated separately. And um, over time, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to um, eliminate the virus from um, the property by slowly replanting infected vineyards or infected blocks and um, be able to come out the end of that with, with a, a vineyard that is more or less clean of this virus and then be able to, to remove some of these restrictions that we're putting on ourselves. Um, on the other side, so we, the, the, the insect seems to be attracted to legumus spe species, but it seems to be repelled or at least not interested in grasses and um, brassica species. So uh, radish, uh, mustard, turnip, things like this. And so we're, we're incorporating a lot of those species into the cover cropping systems, and especially in the new blocks, um, leaning heavily on, on those species as our cover crops, hoping that that will um, not attract those spe the, the insect species into those new blocks um, and, and infect them. Um, and we're even planting borders around those new blocks of 100% uh, um, brassica species, hoping that that might even repel them from, from going into those blocks. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our, our big picture strategy. Overall, the only real solution to, uh, to vine viruses is to try to eliminate them from, from your vineyard. So that means trying to eliminate them when you can from older blocks and try to make sure you're planting new vineyards with the cleanest possible material, which we've gone far and above out of our way to, to try to procure for, for each new planting. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the Applegate Valley itself. Uh, as a growing region. And uh, I remember when we first started to work with biodynamics, it was described to me that this was the ideal place to practice that type of agriculture. Why is that? Yeah, you know, um, in general, we are a fairly, I mean, one, I think there's a few answers to that, but one reason is that this area is fairly um, uh, easy on disease and pest pressure. You know, we don't have um, 
the extremely um, humid and um, cool conditions of Willamette Valley that make it really hard for those folks to manage things like um, powdery mildew, but also um, uh, botrytis and, and other kinds of like fruit rot. Um, we also don't have a lot of the insect species that, um, you know, that, that exist in California, for example. So that's one reason is we have fewer challenges in general, and that allows us to have, you know, fewer restrictions on the things we do. Um, but, you know, I, I really fell in love with the Applegate Valley because I think it's one of the, the I, ideal areas to grow grapes, regardless of biodynamics. But I think biodynamics fits really well with this. It's, again, not, um, it's not an overly uh, wet and humid um, uh, growing region as growing regions go. So again, Willamette maybe being uh, uh, on one end of the spectrum, but it's also not so dry and hot as California is increasingly becoming that um, you have challenges on the other side. Um, for example, we have ample water um, access to irrigation. Um, we don't have uh, conditions that are so extremely stressful to the vine um, as you would in the Central Valley, of California. So I think it's really a, a happy medium um, between those those kind of extremes. You also have your own project. You're developing a nursery, and uh, can we talk about that a little bit? What it's like, and, and what 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 does a vine dirt nursery do? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and in general about Applegate Valley, you know, uh, when I first came here just to do a thesis. And I have a real vivid memory of this. The very first time I came here and was being shown around by my advisor who worked at the experiment station here, we drove around the Rogue Valley and, uh, you know, really beautiful area in general, but it really struck me when I first drove into the Applegate Valley. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a fairly narrow um, valley. And so the mountains are really closed in around you. And um, there's just these beautiful landscapes of, you know, non-vineyard included uh, 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 farms and um, sort of Americana old school barns. And just, it's a really striking place and really has a great vibe to it. And, and I think Applegate Valley might be one of the reasons why I stuck around this area because I eventually, while doing my thesis, found a piece of property that um, I really loved and, and took it upon myself to purchase. And this was just a bare piece of property that I've since developed, um, you know, uh, into a a vineyard and, and grapevine nursery. So, um, you know, one of the, well, the first step to uh, developing a, a, a proper certified nursery is um, getting access to material that comes directly from the national collections in this country. So there's one in, in Davis, um, Foundation Plant Services, and there's another one in Prosser, um, Washington. Um, and um, so first step is to try to procure um, the selections you want and they have this very large number of selections but only a few vines of each so you know when I wanted to um, get any given um, clone of you know whatever variety I, I was interested in sometimes I could only get maybe five vines of that clone and I had to then expand it out from then so it's been a long working progress the first block that I planted has uh, I believe 38 different selections all encompassed in one small little half acre block and I've slowly um grown those out and expanded those um, into additional blocks. Um, one of which is, is for Troon. We planted some Fiano, which um, someday will, will be made, um, made by Troon. And I'm, I'm excited to, to see what that brings. Um, and some of, some of the blocks uh, that I've planted will only be for nursery propagation purposes and some will be for both. Sometimes some blocks will, will harvest fruit and will harvest cuttings from. Um, I will probably not ever become a, 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 a full-blown propagation nursery. My goal is really just to be a source of clean plant material. So what I'm doing is just trying to um, keep my fairly isolated property, property free of, of viruses like red blotch, but any other potential diseases that might contaminate the material so that I can take cuttings, send it out to other nurseries um, that, that I work closely with, to be able to propagate new vines that are coming from the cleanest possible stock. Um, it also allowed me to, um, you know, plant a lot of different varieties um, next to each other and do some experimentation on what, you know, would do well in, in the Applegate Valley and on my site specifically, which has allowed me to then kind of expand out my, my production blocks with some of that knowledge in mind. Um, but it has been a challenge, you know, because it's very different than going to a nursery and just buying thousands of vines of whatever you're looking for. In this case, 
I need to be very selective to create a bottleneck so that every vine that comes onto the property is um, clean and as healthy as possible. So uh, when, once once the, the nursery produces the vines, it goes to wineries like us, and we are in the uh, process of, of replanting the entire property. Could you run through the, the, the how you redevelop a block, the steps uh, to prepare, and then and then uh, plant a new block of vineyard? Sure. Um, so obviously the first step is to remove the old vines. Um, and we'll, we'll often try to do that as quickly as possible now. Um, you know, there's different scenarios in terms of the timing of all this, but usually once we harvest the last crop that we're, we, we're gonna get off of that particular block, we'll go through and um, remove all of the old trunks and, and trellis and, and all the other, you know, workings of, the, of that particular vineyard to get back down to bare ground. Um, once we do that, we want to start preparing the soil. And typically the way we try to approach that is to start with a very deep ripping of the, of the ground. I, as you know, I've made clear, I'm, I'm not a real big fan of um, a lot of tillage, but the, 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 the establishment period is one of the critical times to do the tillage that you need to do to establish sort of a rooting depth that you can work with going forward. So that there's not, necessary to do as much tillage in the future. So we'll typically rip the block with a, a big bulldozer. So a D8 or D10 bulldozer, um, usually down between three and four feet. Um, and then after that, we'll remove all of the additional roots and old trunks and anything else that we might've gotten out, rocks of course as well. Um, and then try to smooth out that, that, that surface layer um, uh, till that further and then establish a cover crop right away. And so all of that needs to be done during a critical period of time, usually sort of towards the late summer and fall, um, so that we can plant a cover crop and that can be then sprouted into the winter time um, so that we don't leave that that bare soil condition, as I was mentioning, that's kind of the last thing that we, we wanna see is bare soil. So, um, and typically we'll, we'll use a, a cover crop that is a, a, a green manure cover crop. So something that's gonna build organic matter be able to be mowed and tilled back into the soil. Although in most of the cases for Troon, because of the red blotch, we're using some of these non-red blotch vector uh, species. Um, so once we once we do that, over that the course of that winter, the cover crop will grow. And while the cover crop's growing, we'll start the process of installing trellis and irrigation. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll um, mark out the vineyard, um, trying to be um, careful to, to um, use a, a, a very precise layout so that going forward, we have uh, precise vineyard row widths and um, everything is as, as um, consistent as possible. That really uh, makes a big difference for a lot of the mechanization of, let's say under the vine tillage or any other tractor work that we have that we want to do in the future. Um, and over the course of that winter, we'll install the trellis, the wire, et cetera, um, any irrigation pipes that we need to, um, and hopefully have everything ready to go to uh, plant um, vines the next spring, which uh, we're about to do in the next month or so. Many of the blocks we're putting in as much as possible, we're, we're planning to use head trained hmm. vines. What are the advantages to using head trained? Yeah, um, that's a good question. One thing I, I left out of the last summary was of course, adding a generous amount of compost during that tillage process. And that's a, a critical thing for, I think any kind of agriculture, whether it's organic, biodynamic or not, and, and, and that, that's, that's really important. Um, and when we do our planting, we'll also add, add compost to each hole. So um, some of the, the blocks, and this is very uh, varietal based, um, are at Truner are being planted as uh, 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 using a head train system. I don't know if um, the folks listening are, are um, familiar with this, it's it's really the oldest system that exists, and it's essentially growing the vine up with a single trunk and a single head that uh, in in Europe will be called uh, goblet or or um, vaso, which you know kind of gives you the sense of uh, a vase or or a glass of, of a of kind of a um, a bowl shaped head that will eventually train. Um, and in the U.S., we tend to to um, train. Uh, head train vines a little higher than in Europe. So sometimes in Europe, you might see these almost on the ground. Um, but in, in the US, we tend to go higher. And in this vineyard, we're especially going a little bit higher 
um, because someday we have some interest in maybe having sheep or animals on the property and we want to get those vines up off the ground. Um, but regardless, you can imagine that um, the, the condition that the fruit is going to grow under is going to be pretty different than a, a trellised um, uh, vineyard. So in a, especially in a classical VSP, you're basically growing the vine um, in a hedge. And um, there, there's some varieties that, that that works really well for, but there's a lot of other varieties, especially upright growing varieties that do really well in this head train system. Um, they, uh, it, it provides kind of a speckled light um, uh, uh, condition in where the fruiting zone is, um, but also allowing each cluster to hang free um, without having to be kind of crammed into a, 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 a tight little box of where, where our hedge would be. Um, you know, the, another um, advantage that, that has been scientifically proven is that um, head train vines are more efficient water users. Um, and this probably has something to do with a combination of exposed leaf area. So you can imagine there's a lot more of the leaves get to see sun when you have a sort of a sprawling system like that, again, as opposed to more of a VSP hedge. Um, but it's also probably because it's, it's shading the ground and so collecting more total sunlight um, and, um, you know, protecting the ground from getting dried out. Um, so those are all, you know, various reasons that we're, we're choosing some blocks to, to do that way. Okay, uh, Lynn has a question. Um, for your vines, have you run into uh, phylloxera where you are? Yeah, so as of now, um, Southern Oregon may be the last bastion where we have not found any phylloxera. Um, I'm told that almost 30 years ago, they did find some phylloxera in the Rogue Valley. And um, they found it, they identified it quickly, and they seem to have eradicated from that site because since then they have not had another outbreak. And there are a lot of unrooted vines in Southern Oregon, um, both old and new actually. Um, you know, this area we can, although it's fairly rare compared to a growing region like Washington or the East Coast, we can still get wintertime cold damage. So some uh, cold damage that might damage trunks. So there's still some incentive to plant own rooted vines because they're a little hardier from that condition. Um, plus they're cheaper, but um, at Troon, we're deciding to plant everything on rootstock because we do anticipate that at some point, phylloxera will make it to this area as it has most other regions of the planet. Um, but yeah, that is one, one advantage of growing in uh, grapevines in Southern Oregon is we don't have to combat them. Now, I'd, I'd like to, I think we should throw it up and for some more uh, questions here. I've unmuted everyone. This is a unique opportunity to ask someone who's uh, had deep uh, viticultural experience in California, France, Portugal, and Oregon. So, uh, Okay, I have another question. Um, have you worked with Jason Lett or Mimi Castile uh, just in regards to, they have a no-till uh, philosophy that they employ in their uh, vineyards in the Willamette Valley and I'm just curious if you guys have crossed paths or shared information. And also he's, they're both big proponents of the types of um, products that you're using, mm -hmm. natural products. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I've never worked directly with them and I can't say that I know them well, but we've crossed paths a number of times and had a, a few discussions. And yeah, I think especially Jason is using some of the, the no-till um, equipment underneath the vine that I was talking about of mowing instead of um, instead of uh, tilling um, and I would say seeing some of his older vineyards and, and his success has been uh, at least it's been it's been encouraging let's just say that we can do it now that said Willamette has a really different climate than southern Oregon mm -hmm. so I think the jury's still out as to what the differences are going to look like but um, but yeah I think that that th both of those folks are um, are pursuing some of some very similar um, strategies that we are. Jason, which was your most challenging region to work in? Like Portugal, France, which one? Or do you, mm -hmm. each had its own challenges? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I'm going to tell you a different one. Um, so I actually also did an internship in Germany. Um, and uh, I worked uh, for an old friend of mine from Davis and his family winery um, in the Faltz region. Yeah. And uh, he um, grows some some somewhat non characteristic varieties um, uh, for Germany. He uh, a lot of Pinot Noir and also Merlot and Syrah. But um, working a harvest in Germany, growing Pinot Noir, I have never spent so much time uh, cutting through rot and mold to get to good fruit um, oh and possible wine. So 
Uh, wow. I, yeah, I could name a lot of other challenges over my career, but I'd say that was one of the most striking. Yeah. What percentage of the uh, vines have been replaced already? And then what does the timeline look like for going forward? Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, we're probably almost halfway there. Um, this after, year. This year, after this year, we'll be more than that. So Yeah, um, so I think that the hope is the last block will be replanted in 2023. Um, so we have a few more years to go. Um, we're doing it, you know, I think it's over a five or six year span total um, is, is our goal. Sure. Are you changing much in the way of varietals? Or are you keeping consistency to the most for the most part? Um, I guess both. I mean, there was a number of varietals that were already on the property, some of which were fairly unusual for Southern Oregon, uh, Vermentino being one of them, that we're absolutely keeping and replanting more mm -hmm. of. But there's others that, you know, really never fit the program. We had a fairly large block of Pinot Noir that, that really fit either the site or the program, and that got removed pretty early on. So I'd say some of both. I mean, there was already the, the varieties that Troon is, is, is known for and is, is pursuing a program with were already on the property, but we are replanting a lot of varieties that, that, that you know, didn't fit and adding more that, you know, that uh, weren't already on the property and some that haven't been planted in Oregon ever before. So we'll see uh, how those do. What are some of those? <laughs> uh, let's see. Negret is one of the more interesting ones, uh, which I don't know very much about. It's going to be interesting to, to try that. Um, it was funny because a, um, a professor of mine um, from my, my program monthly visited Southern Oregon just sort of randomly. He was in the area, and so I was showing them around, and we visited Troon, and we're, we're sort of looking through our replant map. And he's from Toulouse, where Negret comes from, a really small region around that area that that grows it, and he was very excited to see that on anyone's uh, yeah. plans uh, mm -hmm. to plant in, in Oregon. But yeah, we'll see. It's a it's a it's a heavy red um, uh, uh, style wine. That um, yeah, we're just gonna have to see how, how that one does. Um, some other you know varieties that aren't uh, totally unknown to the area, but are definitely more outliers would be um, you know Tanat. Um, you know, we're planting quite a bit of Tanat. Probably going to end up being one of the bigger plantings of Tanat. I would think in Oregon. Um, any others you can think of on that list there, Craig? There's a there's a couple, I think. Well, it, I mean, it, it's it, it's of course it's the basic Rhone Southern French uh, uh, spread. Um, you know, we were putting in Cunois, Cinso. Uh, our our goal is to be focused on a range of blends, and then we'll do some varietal bottlings around those. But our our goal is to come up with with you know strong red white. Uh, uh, um, blends. We're also doing the orange wine blend, for that matter, and through the whole area. So uh, uh, the key is to have this assortment of, of, of varieties and then create uh, blends that are more interesting than they would be on their own. Yeah, we're going to plant some Carignan this year. I bet there's no other Carignan in the state. Um, Picbull de Pinay also, uh, both of which I became real familiar with going to you know, uh, university and, and then spending some time around Southern France. Um, you know, both of those, I have to know, them, but yeah. never be from California. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole range basically of, of uh, uh, Rhone white varieties uh, we're putting in uh, and, and red. So, um, and then the Southwestern with uh, France with Malbec and Tanat. Yeah. I think it may be worth talking about Troon as a site itself, just briefly. Uh, I, you can go into this a little bit more, Jason, but to me, it, it has a unique exposure in uh, the Applegate. It's probably one of the warmest sites yep. in the area with a southwestern roll. And uh, you see a lot more of the vineyards here than I do, but. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And there's been a number of studies, uh, one really good one done by Greg Jones, kind of outlining the, the different temperature zones of the Applegate Valley and all of the Rogue Valley. And there's this little pocket, uh, sometimes called the Kubli Bench, which is where uh, Troon is located, um, that is just one of the, the more open parts of the valley. And so it gets a lot of sunshine, but it's also up higher up in the valley. So it's not close down to the river, but is up on one of the terraces. And, and also is sort of a south southwest facing site. So all those things are contributing to Troon being really, yeah, probably one of the warmest sites, I would say, in the Applegate Valley, which is why we're planting some of these, you know, later ripening uh, warm climate varieties that, you know, I, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't plant some of these things um, at my own property, which is on the other side of the valley, sort of in the Williams um, Valley area, which is sort of an offshoot of Applegate, which is much cooler. And I have an east facing slope as well. So, you know, in general, Applegate and all of Southern Oregon, uh, we grow a lot of different varieties. And the reason why we get away with that is because there's so much um, variety in, in um, mesoclimates in sites. Um, and, you know, Truna is definitely one of the warmer ones of Applegate, which is uh, definitely to our benefit. Uh, another unique aspect I think of Applegate is, is the extremely low pHs we're getting on the grapes. So these wines really naturally high acidity. Uh, what do you think it is in the climate that, that brings that forward? Yeah, it's one of my favorite things about growing in this area is that we have these very cool nights. So we have these very extreme diurnal um, swings during the growing season. Um, Pretty, it's pretty typical to have a 40 degree difference between you know minimum and maximum temperature during the course of the day. And I think that really has a huge impact on, on, on that holding that acidity. Um, you know, we also just don't get real, ex we get occasional, but not very many real extreme um, heat waves. You know, we occasionally get days, you know, that are hundred plus, but it's rare that we get um, a whole lot of them. Although the last few years have, that's changed a little bit. Um, but having those really cool nights to balance out those warm days, even when we get them, I think is what, what really helps us to hold that acidity. If you compare it to California, being further north um, also really makes a, a strong contribution because, you know, we have longer days during the middle of the growing season, but during ripening, the days start to get shorter real quickly. And so that just contributes to that, those cool nights during ripening season. And so, you know, we, we, um, are able to hold acidity, I think. Um, uh, climate change is something everybody in agriculture certainly thinks about. And it's, it certainly uh, impacted some of the choices I think we made here for uh, grape varieties to plant. Uh, what do you, what, how do you see that progressing in the future? Yeah, you know, I really don't know. And I guess, you know, the way that I'm approaching climate change is trying to, you know, expect rather than counting on increasing temperatures, which I'm sure to some degree will have an impact, also trying to plan for more extremes, you know? Um, and I think that goes along with, so we are, one example of, you know, one of the strategies that we already talked about is, you know, we're gonna start trying to establish our newer blocks to be, if not dry farmed, use as little water as possible. And one of the reasons for that, it may be a bit counterintuitive, but um, it's been really well shown that um, vineyards that have not been so vineyards that are dry farm tend to cope better with dry seasons than vineyards that have been irrigated in the past because they've been you know vineyards that have been irrigated are used to that irrigation and dry farm vineyards are, are more they're, they're hardier and so trying to even even though we have access to water trying to basically toughen up our vines for the potential for um, extreme droughts um, you know all that said, we are certainly um, planting varieties that are on the edge, on the warmer side versus the cooler side. As said, we're, we're not planning to, even though I think there are certain areas of Southern Oregon that can still grow quality Pinot Noir, um, we're definitely not planting varieties that, are, are, that we are, are needing cooler climates for. We're planting varieties that we think are going to do well now, but then we'll continue to do well and adapt well to increasing temperatures. Um, you know, Carignan would be a perfect example of that. So would Grenache, which do, um, Grenache does great in Southern Oregon, maybe makes a little bit of a, a lighter, more European style of that, that variety, but it's a variety that will do great if it gets warmer and, you know, will not hurt us at all if, if that is the, the trajectory. Any more questions as we hit the end of our hour here? Um, I guess I have a question for both of you. And it just has to do with both of you started on this journey, not quite sure, you know, what, where it was going to lead. And I've tasted your wines and they're amazing. And I just wonder from your perspectives, what it feels like to have that, un, you know, that journey and then get to the end. I mean, you're not at the end quite, but just to have some, some positive reinforcement. How does that feel? Well, I, I mean, that's why I'm here. I, when I first saw this property, it just looked like it had the potential to make very special, unique wines. Uh, I tasted a lot of the wines at the time, and you could taste flashes of it. 
you know, you could see a little bit there, a little potential, but it just wasn't being realized. And uh, so moving to uh, the type of viticulture that Jason has implemented here and uh, layering biodynamics into the, uh, the picture, every year you've been able to see progress. For instance, some of these vines, some of them were really on the edge of life, and I'm not saying they're perfectly healthy now, but they've really, uh, uh, they've really come back as, as more healthy plants and uh, are, are living out their last years a little happier than they were, were before. So uh, that's, it's, it's been extremely rewarding. And now the wines, I think coming out with the 2019 vintage, I think it really reflects this, they're starting to really reflect the work that has been, been done. So uh, that's really rewarding to me. Yeah, and I would echo that in terms of being able to really see see the benefits of what we're doing in vine health. And again, I mean, you know, we do a lot of plant tissue analysis and a lot of other like, slightly more technical things to try to uh, um, analyze plant health, but you can see it in the vines. Anybody would be able to tell the difference between when we started and, and now. And just being able to see that difference is, is really rewarding. Um, you know, I've farmed in pretty much every form that you can think of when it comes to vineyards um, all around the world. Um, but my interest um, has always been in, in, in organic farming and some of the practices we've talked about. So being able to uh, be given free reign to try to implement some of these, these, um, these strategies and then being able to see the difference in the vines has been great. I mean, really been, been um, one of my favorite projects that I've worked on in my career. And, uh, you know, now starting to see some of the wines that are coming out of that. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, like Craig said, really 2019 is where some of that's really going to start shining, you know, because we've finally been able to get to a point where we're fully transitioned into the practices we want to be. And uh, going forward, I can't wait to see, see the wines that are produced, especially out of some of the varieties we just mentioned that are, you know, being planted sometimes for the first time in the state. It's been very important for us, too, is to combine science and biodynamics. I mean, we're looking, we're trying to dig into what it is about biodynamics that uh, uh, we've all, you know, we tasted the results. That's how I, that led me to biodynamics, just tasting wines and saying, well, that wine's great. And then, oh, it's biodynamic. And eventually you're converted. So we're working, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the professors from Oregon State, University of Oregon, and Linfield. We're doing, uh, uh, we're doing, sampling the vineyards constantly. We're just doing everything we can to document what we learn by this process and then hopefully pass that forward to other farmers. Absolutely. I think there's a misconception that organic or biodynamic means anti-science and that's definitely not our approach. Our approach is to take the best of both worlds. Are you seeing any chance along that line with other folks jumping on that that direction in, in, in Applegate or other places in Southern Oregon, looking at it and saying, wow, there is something to be said for this style of, of, of growing and so forth. Yeah, when I first uh, moved to Southern Oregon, it was actually, to me, fairly striking that there were so few organic and, and biodynamic farming or, or vineyards in the area. Um, you know, I would say the lowest percentage of any of the regions I'd worked in before. And that, I think that is starting to change. Um, you know, there's a number of other colleagues in the area that I think are, if not moving as quickly as Troon has towards those practices, mm -hmm. is starting to try to implement them as much as possible. And, you know, I, I've worked with a number of other clients throughout the valley, and there's just continuously increasing interest in in these practices. And I'm really encouraged by that. Um, yeah, it's a paradigm shift for sure. I mean, it's yeah. just but it's worth, I believe it's worth. And that's why I'm fairly new to Troon. I'm new to Southern Oregon in general. We were in Seattle for 16 years, came back to Oregon. We were more North before, but I live in the Umpqua Valley and you know, have several friends that are growing here and so forth and making wine. But uh, we've just in the last six months started exploring more of what's down in, in your area. And we read about and learned about uh, the, your style of, of, of cultivation. And that's what led us to go and visit you and join the club and so forth. And uh, want to be an advocate for that style. We do our own gardening and, and it's all organic and companion planting and self-composting and so forth here at home. And, 
you know, it's important to us to find um, folks that we're willing to um, patronize and you're stood out and it was a draw for us. And we're certainly going to take people down to visit your place as, as we get into the point in time in the hopefully near future when we can start to do that again. <laughs> Well, so, thank you very much. I appreciate your I appreciate commitment this to this. I assure you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's great to hear. And I think what, you know, a lot of what I'm seeing in the industry as a whole is that there is a lot of consumer consumers driving these changes, you know, and, and you have consumers that are interested and care about this stuff and maybe ask questions in, in tasting rooms or anywhere else about it. Um, it, it people notice and, and that mm -hmm. makes a difference in their motivations of how to farm. Sure. I, I own a tea business and I work only with organic tea farmers across Japan, you know, Sri Lanka, Nepal, India, wherever. And uh, that that's the commitment that we've made as a company a dozen, 15 years ago. And so that's something we always look for when we're out there shopping for other other products to bring into our own home. So I appreciate the mindset. Thank you. OK, well. Thank you, Jason. We really appreciate your, your time and the information. And the hey, time. Yeah. Great to meet all you folks. And uh, yeah, have a great one.